see all of you here today. I hope you're doing well. I hope you had a good Thanksgiving holiday. I hope you didn't eat too much turkey. Um, I don't know if you're like me, but I was telling them earlier, I, I got my plate, and I noticed I didn't get any turkey. There were so many good sides. I was like, wait a second, something's missing. So I had to get a whole nother plate just for the turkey. Um, but it was a good uh, good thing. And we weren't here to get Ma's dressing, so we're doing that after church today. So that's going to be good. So my Thanksgiving will com- be complete. Uh, get it all that we need. Some things in the uh, bulletin I want to lift up to you. First and foremost, Angel Tree uh, begins today. A lot of you have already gone up and got some angels off of there. Every angel on the tree and up there represents a family, um, children that need presents. And those presents are coming from you um, by way of their parents who are in prison. Uh, a mother or father is incarcerated and put their child on the list for Angel Tree and churches and other um, people all around the globe send uh, presents in, in, in lieu of their parents, from their parents. And so the information is there. After the service, you can come up here and you can get a child. Everything that you need to know is on there. Um, Miss Belinda will be there and she'll kind of guide you if you have any questions. Um, one thing I want to change. In your bulletin, it says that these are due back Sunday, December the 7th. Well, Sunday, December the 7th is not a Sunday. <laughs> so it's December the 12th. So please make a note of that. If you're going to get an um, angel tree, please make a note that it's December the 12th and not the 7th. Um, so I want to make a note of that. But I appreciate you supporting angel tree and being a part of that um, ministry that I think is so important. The other thing that I want you to notice is inside your bulletin is an Advent um, prayer calendar. Um, our conference gave us a lot of different ideas for Um, the Advent season, and one of them that they gave us was this, and I thought it was such a great idea. Um, um, Ruth Ann has taken it and kind of added some things, made it ours, Um, but on there, you can also find this on our website, on there each day, like for today, today, all of us will be praying for wisdom for local and national leaders. I just think that's a neat idea all throughout Advent for the church family as a whole to be praying Um, for these needs and so anyway i hope you'll take this put it on your refrigerator and at some point know that your church family is praying through the advent season with you specifically for those things Um, there's a note about mailchimp if you are a visitor with us or if you have been coming and you're not uh, associated with our mail um, mail outs that we send which are vital the way we communicate mailchimp is the way we do that and that little um, clip in your bulletin that's exactly how you can sign up. So if you are here today and you'd like to get our emails with the announcements and other things, you can follow the instructions there and, um, you know, get, get hooked up with that. And the last thing I want to lift up is poinsettias. that is. We're going to do those this year. We don't know how much they are. Ms. Carlin is working um, with them to kind of get that price. But we are going to do them, and we wanted to put that in your mind so you'll know. We'll do that in honor or in memory of someone that you want to do that for um, and we'll probably put those in <clears throat> the week, the last week of the, the third Sunday of Advent to the um, Christmas Eve. So they'll be in uh, hopefully by then. But as soon as we find out how much they are, we'll, we'll give you that information via the email. So if you need to sign up for email, follow the instructions. Um, we want to make sure to hit that really hard about our email. And then the final thing before we move into our service is on your um, tear off there, You'll see the, the, the kind of the blurb about the December 5th meal. If you're here today and you're in a Sunday school class or you would like to be in, involved in Sunday school, but may, maybe you never had that opportunity to do that, we are going to have a meal next Sunday after church for all Sunday school classes and those folks who would like to be a part of Sunday school. Um, So that'll be directly after the service. You don't have to make anything. You don't have to bring anything. We're going to provide the meal for you. But we do need to know how many of you are coming. So right there on that tear-off, you can simply put your name underneath the line and put how many will be with your family. And that way we can have an idea of how many to prepare for for next Sunday after the service, okay? So I hope you will be a part of that. And it's a good time to kind of lift up Sunday school and get you involved if you're not. All right, with all that being said, we're going to continue on in our service.
Did I tell you? Say one more time. Say it again. Did I tell you? Translation, today we light the hope candle. Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk, not be faint. Isaiah 40, 31. Hope looks to God and waits on him with a firm expectation that he will fulfill his promises. Allied with hope are the ideas of faith and patience, endurance and trust of joy, and a settled peace that God will do what he says he will do. Israel has been beaten down by a succession of world powers, Babylon, Persia, the Greeks, and now Rome. In their distress, they call out, Come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel. Yet in the cry, there is hope, a strong expectation that God will keep his promises to send a Messiah, a deliverer. The hope is fulfilled on the first Christmas day when Jesus is born in Bethlehem. God's Savior sent to planet Earth to save us from our sins and deliver us from whatever oppresses us. People live in hope of one who can help them. Jesus is that person, present today by the Holy Spirit, to deliver us from any need. He is the one we hope for. Father, thank you for sending Jesus into our world, our hope of glory, our blessed hope of resurrection and eternal life. In his name we pray, amen. We've already done it, I think invited him to be a part of this time together but I think it's fitting that we stand in honor of the Advent King um, as we uh, pray and invite him to be with us in our service today would you stand let's pray Heavenly Father I am so thankful for who you are I'm so thankful for the hope that we find in you this first Sunday of Advent We begin this journey fresh and new. Fill us with your hope. Fill us with not only the hope of the Savior that came to that little town of Bethlehem, but the King who will return again and ransom us himself. We love you, Father, today. May all we do, all we say, bring glory and honor to your name. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Let's remain standing as we join together in singing, Come Thou long expected Jesus.
seated. As we come now for a time of prayer, I'm glad to see Petri and family back. They went hiking on the trail, at, trail of Tears. No, that's probably what y'all did while you were the Appalachia Trail. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, I, I thought I think it. Jay said it was like 15 degrees up there at some point. 19. That's great. That's great. How many of y'all wanted to do that? That would be so great, right? 19 degrees. Well, we're glad you're home safe and sound. So that's something to be praying for, for sure. Um, but we do have a lot of folks that we want to be lifting up. Um, as I stated last week, this season is a difficult season in some regards for those who've lost loved ones. Um, my grandmother, I can remember sitting around Christmas when we had the opportunity to be with her when she was up, up in New York. And she would still talk about loved ones that were not around the table. And so um, we all have those loved ones that are missed. And uh, let's remember folks this season um, in that. Um, we also want to remember those who are sick and, and battling different things. Please keep Mike in your prayers. Um, he is set for December 21st to have surgery. Um, we want to pray for him in that. Uh, pray for wisdom as he moves forward um, with that. Um, we have, I know, a lot. And if you're here today and you have a need that you've not let us know about, that that you would like to be on the prayer list, please tear the perforated part of your bulletin off. Put that need down. Put it in the um, offering plate. Um, the ushers will be bringing the uh, offering plates down here. You can put them here at, before you leave, um, and we will be faithful to be praying for those needs. Um, and again, we've gotten a lot of unspoken, and I'm thankful for that as well. Um, you may have things going on, and you think, I don't want to let anybody know about this. Well, you can let us know by just simply putting unspoken, and we will be praying for those unspoken needs, even though we don't know what they are, because God does, right? Every unspoken need, I promise you, God knows exactly what that unspoken need is, and, and we can pray for that unspoken need. Let's have a moment of silence as we gather our thoughts together. Um, this is a time for you to pray with me, um, not to hear me pray, as together we lift our prayer. Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for who you are. I thank you for your love. I thank you for the opportunity that we have to be here on this first Sunday of Advent. God, I am so thankful for the hope that we find in you. Um, o come, O come, Emmanuel. Um, that was the cry of your people in that day. And Lord, they were longing for um, a return to what was lost in the Garden of Eden. That community that we had with you, that communion that we had with you, that connection that we could walk with you in the cool of the evening um, side by side was lost. And the Old Testament is a cry for that to, to be restored. And when they say, oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel, they say, oh, come, oh, come, God with us. We long to be back with you. And Jesus did come. And Jesus was Emmanuel. And by his death and resurrection on the cross of Calvary, he paid the ransom for our sin. And so today, God, we stand in light of that promise. We stand in light of that hope as we are uh, connected back with you through what Jesus has done. Today, we can feel your presence. Today, your presence is inside of us. Today, Lord, no matter what we go through, you're there. We are so thankful for that promise and for the hope we find in it. Be with us, Lord, in the rest of this service. You know our needs before we ask. We ask that you would minister to all those on our prayer list, all those gathered here today, whatever the need may be. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, for the hope of Jesus. We pray these things in your son's name. Amen. Here I am to worship says, light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see beauty that made this heart adore you, hope of a life spent with you, and here I am to worship. Let's worship him this morning as we stand and as we sing.
Let's stand for the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son. Go now back to the back if you'd like to go.
God alone created all these things we call our own. From the mighty to the small, the glory in them all is God's and God's alone. God and God alone reveals the truth of all we call unknown. And all the best and worst of man won't change the master's plan. It's God's and God's alone. God and God alone is fit to take the universe's throne. Let everything that lives reserve its truest praise for God and God alone. God and God alone will be the joy of our eternal home. He will be our one desire. Our hearts will never tire of God and God alone. God and God alone is fit to take the universe's throne. Let everything that lives reserve its truest praise for God and God alone. God and God alone is fit to take the universe is thrown. Let everything that lives reserve its truest praise for God and God. Let everything that lives reserve its truest praise I was going to sing that solo, but uh, don't quite have the pipes yet. <laughs> nah, he's just so good. I thank you, Mike, for that special for us this morning. Uh, we have some talented folks. Um, how many of you surprised by the choir up in the top? That's kind of, yeah, good. That's what, that was what we were trying to do. Um, the whole, nah, not really. We just wanted to give that element. That is such a cool song, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, and what it means for us. So we've been talking about the idea of awakened people and what it means to be awakened and, and living a life of the Spirit. And all along the way, we've been associating living the awakened life and how that um, affects different things. Thankfulness, we talked about that last week. Well, now we're moving into the season of Advent. The first um, candle that was lit this morning is the candle of hope. It is the foundation, is the building block. Each candle we light along the way 
step onto one another as we make our way to the night of the nativity. Hope. Hope is defined as a feeling of expectation and desire for a certain thing to happen. We've used this so many times. I hope I pass the test, right? Well, there has to be some studying to go along to help that hope out. But hopefully, hope, you know, that studying takes place. I hope I don't get a ticket, right? We, we say that a lot when we're driving. Well, if you go to Whispering Pines, they have a new robot system over there. And Albany's not quite as nice as Leesburg, because Leesburg will give you a warning until the new year, just an FYI for all there. I've gotten uh, a picture of my license plate from Leesburg with a warning, uh, and I got a ticket in Albany. So my hope for the not getting a ticket, I didn't even know I was going, I didn't even know, it was 38 and a 25. And let me just tell you, that's 80 bucks. And Merry Christmas to me, that's right. Um... So be aware of that. Uh, 38, it doesn't even give you time to slow down. If you're slowing down and you're over the thing, you, you get a ticket. So be ready for that. Hope. I hope I wouldn't get a ticket, but I did. So sometimes our hope, we think, is diminished, right? Somehow hope is not a, as solid of a foundation as we thought it was. Because things don't work out the way we want them to. We've all been through circumstances in this life where we had hope that one outcome would take place, but yet another outcome happened. Um, it could be something as simple as a football game. Many hoped Lee County would continue on in the playoffs, but we got beat by a very good team in Buford. And so that's the way it ended up. Many people hoped Georgia would beat Georgia Tech. <laughs> that hope came through. Sorry for those who are taking. Hope in games or football is not the same as hope connected to faith, right? If our hope is the same hope, we are going to be disappointed. As a Georgia fan, I understand what that disappointment is over the countless years. But I can tell you today, God has not disappointed me once. Even when things didn't turn out the way I wanted them to, my hope in Him is still sustained in the truth of His promises. We have to understand that. And as we look at our um, pro prophetic word, we heard from Isaiah in the lighting of the Advent wreath. And that same hope and promise we find in our passage today in Jeremiah 33. But to understand where this hope comes from, we have to understand where they're living. What is the atmosphere of where they're living? Listen to what one professor said about Jeremiah in the midst of this promise of hope. This comes from the beginning of 33. Professor, Mi Professor Michael Chan writes about this. Prison is a bad enough, but it gets worse for Jeremiah, who is forced to serve his prison sentence in the middle of a foreign invasion. In addition to these horrifying external realities, Jeremiah also carries the burden of his message that Judah's situation is going to get worse before it gets better. The faith faithlessness of Judah's leaders and its disregard for its society responsibilities invited death and destruction into the city's once mighty walls. Jeremiah's description is potent and it's terrifying. Listen to it. The Chaldeans are coming in to fight and to fill them with the dead bodies of those whom I shall strike down in my anger and in my wrath. For I have hidden my face from this city because of all their wickedness. In this place of which you say, it is a waste without human beings or animals. In the towns of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem that are desolate without inha inhabitants, human or animal. This is the place that we find our prophetic word about the Messiah. This is the place where God gives his message of hope. Listen, things may be bad for us in this community, but I don't know that any of us have had to live in what Jeremiah is living in when he speaks the promises of God. Listen to the words that we find, the hope for the Advent season. Jeremiah 33, 14 through 16. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the good word which I have spoken concerning the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days, and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch of David to spring forth, and he shall execute justice and righteousness on the earth. In those days, Judah shall be saved, and Jerusalem shall dwell in safety. And this is the name by which she shall be called, the Lord 
is our righteousness. So in the midst of these awful moments that we read about at the beginning of chapter 33 in Jeremiah, Jeremiah declares a word from God of reminding them of the promise. I want you to hear this this morning. We have been engaged in the gospel project and studying of Abraham. And God made a promise to Abraham, didn't he? He said, you are going to be the father of many nations, like unto the stars in the sky. That was the promise that God, Yahweh, made to Abraham. So Abraham has this idea that he is going to be a father someday. And all along the way in the story, Abraham is thinking this is going to happen. Abraham's getting older, and he's getting older, and he's getting older. And this is not happening. So Abraham takes matters into his own hands with his wife, and he has a child with a servant. But that's not God's promise for him. And one would think, okay, you messed up the promise. You're not getting it anymore. But aren't you thankful that God's promises are not dependent on what we do? They're all dependent on what he does. His promises are true all along the way. And so Abraham continues to wait on the Lord. And finally, that blessed promised child comes. And then God says, I want you to take that promised child, Abraham. And I want you to take him up to the mountain. And I want you to sacrifice him. Can you imagine this promised child? Wait a second. He's the connection to the promise you made. How would you do that, fathers? How would you take your, your child, the promised child, and just go and put them on an altar? I don't know the answer to that, but Abraham does. Because Abraham's trust in God's promises are so true that he is going to do it with the idea that God will either bring my son back to life, or he will provide another way. And so Abraham takes Isaac. And I want you to understand Isaac's faith in this as well. Daddy's going up to sacrifice and he didn't have a cow or a lamb. He's no dummy. He understands clearly what's going on. And then to top it off at the moment, Isaac lays himself down on that altar. Abraham doesn't have to force him. He doesn't have to tie him down. Abraham son gets up on that altar the promised one and Abraham is about to do what God has commanded him to do even though it means the promise could be over and God stays his hand the imagery of Jesus Christ in the midst of that Abraham story the perfect son Isaac was not perfect Jesus was Isaac could not be the sacrifice for humanity because he was only human. What an image of Jesus' promise fulfilled in the midst of so many years yet to come. I'm here today to tell you, you can trust the promises of God. Your hope is not lost on him. Your hope is not sinking sand. Your hope is built on the Solid, foundational rock of Jesus Christ. He will not let you down. That doesn't mean he's always going to do it the way you want him to. That doesn't mean it'll always be the way you prayed. Because sometimes God does things differently. And our story today, this hope is something we can hold on to. He gives us some connections, righteous brand of David. The idea of justice and righteousness coming forth. But this section is all about God's promises and our hope in them. These people longed for a Savior to come. And he did. He did. Just as he promised in a little town in Bethlehem to a poor family who even in the moment of the birth did not have a place to stay. 
in a place where animals do all the things that animals do. We went ants for Thanksgiving, and if you saw the pictures on Facebook, she has a thousand animals out there. And her barn is, is right there, and, and the family was sitting on the fence, and we were just having a good time, and, and her big, beautiful horse just walked right up to us and went to the restroom right there. And I was like, what in the world? This is, look away, Ben, look away. No, we didn't put that picture on Facebook. But that's, that's where Jesus was born in the midst of this. It wasn't clean. It, it, it hadn't been dusted. It, it was dirty. And there was animal droppings. There were animals. This is where Jesus came, just as it was foretold. The promises of God are true, and you can hope in them without remorse. They are concrete, church. When you come to the place where you're awakened to the Spirit of God in your life, the hope of God reigns in your heart and life. And it's transformative. I believe with all my heart, those who trusted in Yahweh in the midst of Jeremiah's day, it was that hope that saw them through the most difficult moments. You, my friends, who go through what you've been through, holding on to the arms of God, it's that hope that He is going to get you through. When my brother did not get healed, when my prayers of healing in this life went unanswered, my lifeline was the hope I had that he was going to get us through it. And he did. If you look back in your own circumstances, your own difficult moments, wasn't it your faith in him that got you through? Listen, when my brother breathed his last, my hope in the eternal did not go away. It was strengthened. Because he's realizing the hope of his salvation. As are all our loved ones that have gone before. Hope. Hope of a promise. Have you ever made a promise to someone that you broke? Have you ever done that? If we're honest, we've all done that before. Maybe it was work. Maybe it was something else. And when we make a promise to our children and we can't come through on that promise, that's even harder, isn't it? Because you don't intentionally go out to not fulfill that promise. Let me tell you something. God will never break his promises to you. He won't. He never has. There's nowhere in scripture where you find he has broken in a promise. He said he would never ever do what happened in the flood ever again. Has he done it? Has our world gotten wicked and evil in certain places? Yes, it has. Has he flooded the world again? No. No. Because he made a promise. Every time you see that rainbow in the sky, that rainbow was given to us by God. And it is a sign of his promise. That's what the rainbow is all about. It's a sign of his promise. So when you see it, it is a re remember what I said to you. I'll never break my promises to you. Therefore, your hope can stand why does this matter because when we live the awakened life and that hope is in us it is something that impacts the lives around us there's a guy that works on Wednesday his name's Sandy and I don't know if any of you have had a chance to meet Sandy. But he is someone that I have never seen upset. Even when things don't go his way, he just laughs and smiles. He doesn't have a whole lot. 
But Sandy has made an impact in my life. His positivity, his hope is infectious. It really is. And I find myself this week thinking about Sandy a lot. I missed him Wednesday when we didn't have our food pantry. Because there's something about being around somebody like that that makes a difference. When you carry the hope of Advent, the hope of Jesus, you make a mark. Young people, you make a mark in your high schools, your middle schools. You make a mark in the places you work. You really do. The kids worked at Mark's Melon Patch, and they got about three checks, maybe. Um, and we went to SunTrust, I mean Truist, it's Truist now. We went to Truist and got their checks cashed. And the same woman was behind the counter every time we went. And she just lit up when she saw us coming. Me and the kids, I joke with them, and, and you know, they, they laugh, and, and I pick on them, and they laugh. And she was laughing at me, picking on them. And, and she's, here they come. And, she, you know, she just, she knew us when we came in. Well, this last check they got, Krista, we went, and Krista went in with them. And she said the same thing. And she was like, are y'all still working? And the twins said, no, we're not working anymore. And she was disappointed. Because they wouldn't be coming back in to get their checks cashed. Now, that may seem simple. But for me, it gives me hope that we can live a certain way. And we can leave a mark in a certain way. And the Jesus in her could find the Jesus in us and bring a smile, laughter. Because let me tell you something. We're living in a world that has no hope. If this is all we have, if there is no eternity, if there is nothing after this, this is it. And there are many people who go to funerals and that's it. They lay their loved one down in the grave and it's over. What a hopeless state to find yourself in. But that's not the truth. Just as the promise of God was that Jesus would come, we have another promise. That he'll come again. I go to prepare a place for you. If it were not so, I would not tell you. So that where you are, where I am, there you will be as well. That's the promise of God. That's the hope of eternity. Jesus left them as he ascended. With the promise. And all along the way, that promise has been fulfilled. And I believe it will be fulfilled ultimately when the king returns in all of his glory. But people need to know that story. People need to find the hope. I don't know how many of you have ever seen Shawshank Redemption. That's one of my favorite movies. Every time it comes on TV, if I'm doing something, I ultimately sit down and I'll just watch it. I mean, I just will. Stories about Andy, a guy that gets convicted of a serious crime, even though he didn't do it. And he goes to Shawshank Prison. And he has a hard and a difficult time. But he gets close to someone named Red. Andy says this in the midst of the movie. He says, there's something inside that can't get to you. They can't get to you. That they can't touch. Hope. Andy says, hope, Red replies, hope is a dangerous thing. Hope can drive a man insane. There's no use for hope in a place like this. You see, Andy, in the midst of the movie, walks as if he's kind of above it all. And for many of the prisoners, they look at Andy and think he thinks he's something special. But that's not how Andy is at all. See, Andy just walks with something like he knows something no one else does. And Andy, our kind of hero in the midst of this movie, I won't ruin it for you if you haven't seen it, but you should. It's been out for a long, long time. It's 
Things happen, and Andy is not in prison anymore. We'll just say that. And so Red is left in this prison, in this place of hopelessness, missing the one person who seemed to have hope. Well, Andy sends a letter, and he says to Red, Remember, Red, hope is a good thing. Maybe the best things, no good thing ever dies. So we have this red who has gone for parole over and over again. And finally, he gets out. And there's this meeting with him and his friend. And this man who had no hope ends the movie with this statement. I want you to hear it. I hope I can make it across the border. I hope to see my friend and shake his hand. I hope the Pacific is as blue as it has been in my mind. Oh, how I hope. That's how it ends. Now, that's a movie. And it's a movie based on a worldly kind of idea of what hope is. But that's the kind of hope that can transform people's lives. Listen, when you have hope, when you walk in the awakened life with this hope that Christ gives us, it is, it is something that the world looks at and says, what do you got? Why are you so happy? I want to be that person that even when things are bad, there's a light shining. My heart is broken, but I'm still standing on the rock. Physically, I'm broken, but I'm still standing on the rock. I've lost the one I care for the most, but I'm still standing on the rock. That's hope. So it's fitting that we begin our journey to Bethlehem, standing on hope. So as we come now uh, to our invitation, the altar is open. Maybe you're here today and you can say, as I begin this Advent season, hope is not the word I would hold on to right now. For whatever reason, I am almost out of hope. Maybe you've been going through something difficult. Maybe relationships are stressed at work or at home. Maybe there's something else going on. And maybe you would look and you would say, I, I would like to have that hope. Well, here's the lifeline. When we're sinking in the midst of the deep ocean, God throws a lifeline. And the lifeline, the life preserver, his name is Jesus. I'm not telling you if you put your hope and trust in him, it'll all be done today. But I promise you, he'll keep you above water. He'll give you something to hold on to in the difficult moments. So that when those difficult moments go away, and let me tell you something, storms will always go away. It may take longer for some than others, but ultimately the storm will fade. You'll be standing on that solid rock again, holding on to that life preserver. And I promise you'll never want to let it go. So maybe that's you here today. The altar's open for you to come. Receive that hope fresh and new. Maybe you're here today and you're saying, you know, I got it and I get it, but I just need to refresh it. This season has come at the right time. I am ready for Advent. I am ready to be reminded once again of my hope and my salvation. For whatever reason, the altar is open for you to come. Emmanuel was the hope of the people of God. That God once more would be with us. Emmanuel is here. He has come. And he will come again. Promises. Hope. We can trust. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we come now for this time of invitation, I am so thankful for your promises. I'm so thankful for the hope that we find in them. Lord, as we come now to this time of invitation, maybe we're here today and we just don't seem to have any hope. Maybe things have been rough and it's been hard and we're just almost ready to give up. Help us to re remember that Jeremiah lived in a difficult moment, in a difficult place and time. And he went through some of the most difficult things we could ever imagine. 
And yet, he held on to the hope of the promises that you've given. Allow us to see those promises fresh and new. And hold on to them for ourselves as we trust in this season of Advent. And the Savior who comes as a child in the manger, who lives a life and becomes the sacrificial lamb for us. We love you, Father. Thank you for the hope that we find in you. Be with us now. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's stand as we sing Emmanuel. I love childlike faith, right? And their hope is just infectious. And the other day, Ben was talking about what he was going to be, and he is going to be an astronaut and a deep sea diver, I guess, so he can explore the vastness of both space and the ocean. And I said, Are you going to be a preacher? He's like, Nah, I'm just going to be an astronaut. So, okay. Um, but he hopes, man. I mean, you could see it. It's like, it's no doubt. That's what he's going to do. I mean, no doubt. Um, I, think it's, I think it's poignant that Jesus says we need to have faith like a child, right? I was listening, coming here for the early service. Uh, Gloria Estefan, I want to see Christmas through your eyes, right? The song's all about seeing Christmas through children's eyes. As we get older, we kind of lose the magic of Christmas, don't we? That's that faith, that hope built on something. Let's not lose that. Let's have faith like a child, like God calls us to have. So that hope will be strong in the promises of God. And we won't doubt, even when difficult moments come, we'll trust Him to fulfill what He's promised. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, we love you. And we are so thankful for this family of faith that we're a part of. We got a lot going on this season, but I'm excited about it. Lord, be with us as a church. We've started this journey with hope. I pray all of us would see that hope grow in this season. And allow it to impact the world in which we live. Work, home, wherever we go. Let us show the world what it means to be hopeful. To hope in something real, even in difficult moments. I am so thankful for your people. God, use them this week, we pray. In your son's precious name, you are dismissed.